Welcome back, everyone. So before we went to the break, we were talking about um, the types of requirements. Do you have any questions before I move to the next topic? All right, so silence is no for me. Let's move to the next topic. So what is the requirement management? When we say a requirement management, what does it mean? So before I go ahead, let me tell you one thing very quickly. In your interviews, you will most probably be asked, how do you manage requirements? So this question may be like really vague. If the interviewer is asking, how do you manage the requirements, probably he or she might be asking you, how do you make sure you do not um, accepting the changes or you managing the changes in when uh, you're getting from the business in the middle of the project, middle of the de development phase, you know, during implementation, if you're getting a change, how do you manage all those things? So I would recommend you better ask them what ex exactly do they mean by requirement management kind of thing. Now, coming back to the course here, when I say requirement management, it means that's that certain things you can do when you have to actually manage the requirements. First thing is a stakeholder commitment. Now, what do you mean by stakeholder commitment? Stakeholder commitment as in everybody, all the stakeholders who are directly, indirectly involved with the project, they all have to be committed towards the successful delivery of the project. So who are the stakeholders? We have already discussed in the previous classes, but let me give you a little idea just to revise your knowledge. Stakeholder may be someone who is funding your project. Stakeholder may be someone who is actually going to use the end product. Stakeholder is someone who is developing this project like your development team. You are one of the stakeholders as a BA. Your project manager, anyone who is directly or indirectly involved with this project is a stakeholder. And it is Equally, everyone's responsibility to make certain project is a successful. So everybody has to be committed a little bit on that. Then baseline. So as a BA, this is very important for you to baseline everything. Now, what do you mean by baseline? Baseline is nothing but the official approval of the documentations. Baseline could be on your project requirements, your like your requirement documentations say it's CBR or BRD or um, SRS, or this could be your schedule, this could be your cost, anything that is officially reviewed and formally approved and agreed upon with all the stakeholders will be considered as a baseline. Once it is baseline, that will further be used for the further you know, uh, developments of the work. And any changes to the baseline Documents will only go through some organizational change control procedures. There is a process of handling change management in traditional waterfall, and agile way of working has an entirely different way of handling changes. So once you get the change in the baseline documentation, you will not simply accept or deny it. What you will do, the first thing is you will document the change as a new change request. You will do your analysis, and see if that is possible or not possible. What is the impact on different the applications, different LOBs, different teams, or your internal development work that you have already completed? You will come up with like a detailed report and then you will share with business. And that report may also include like high level budget, high level timeline that, that you might need, all those impacted areas, so that business will be aware of that changes. And then once business approves it, this will go through the change management process. So in further classes, we'll discuss in detail what is change management and how do we go through it in its phases of the change managing, uh, management process, uh, change control in any of the organizations. This might be one person handling the whole change management process or maybe like group of people or maybe different teams within an organization. So we'll discuss in detail later on. Here, for you to understand is, baseline is very important when you are saying the management, the requirement management. You can only manage things when it is baseline, approved and agreed with everyone. Now, as I said, change control. Change control is very important. Every company may have defined it differently. You know, in company A may have 
different stages of the change control procedures. Company B may have a different stages. So wherever you work, you have to follow the change control procedures within that company. Now, traceability metrics. What is this? Traceability metrics is very important for a BA. This is like your day-to-day -day working sheet. You know, traceability metrics, you can create in simple Excel, like a very layman tool, or you can have like fancy tools, online tools that you can go and use and create your traceability metrics. As name appears, traceability metrics is to trace something, you know, to track something, to relate something. Now, what exactly does it do and how do we write? So how do we write? What should be the format looking like? Uh, we will discuss in separate classes. Here, to give you a background on the traceability metrics, traceability metrics like, you know, in the Excel, you will write the requirement number, little bit description of the requirement. Maybe you can also have some IDs of the requirement. And you will also document what is the reason and what is the source of this requirement. And you will also write what section of the software requirement documentation you have mentioned the details about this requirement. So that in future, if any of your employees or your colleagues or peers or management, whoever is coming to you and asking about any specific requirement, you should be able to go and find the details of the requirement. So what is forward traceability and what is backward traceability? Now we know traceability is something we need to track something in, uh, from one source to different source. So forward traceability means you are going from your traceability matrix to your software requirement document, SRS. You have one ID. From that ID, you will go to the SRS and find that ID there as well. And you will see the details of the requirement and you can tell the person, okay, this is what we have mentioned as the requirement. And this is exactly this is going to do all functional, non-functional things you can track and tell the people. Same example, you are already in the SRS document. You're reviewing it with someone with only any XYZ reasons or XYZ times situations. And you are being asked questions about one of the requirement. What was the source of the requirement? Why did you capture this one? In that case, probably you, you would want to go back to your trace, trace matrix. So you already have that ID and section number in the SRS. You will go to your trace matrix. You will find that section and then you will be able to know what was the source of the requirement and why did you capture that requirement. So you should be able to easily track things, relate things and, and help explain yourself and explain to the other team members as well, whoever is, is needing all those details. So trace, traceability metrics is something a BA will be creating and using for her or him own working sheet purposes. Very important thing to remember, trace metrics is not required by the project. You don't have to upload this trace, trace metrics to the functional requirement section or anywhere in the SRS or BRD or any other documentations. This is purely yours and internal to you. You don't need to share it, share it with business. Business has to do nothing with your traceability metrics. Business is not going to approve or reject your requirement documentation based on the trace metrics. So you can go ahead and share this metrics with your internal team members. Let's say the developers, your junior BAs, your colleague BAs, your product manager, Internally, you would want them to use and get benefited and track things and know what is what was the purpose, what was the reason, what was the source of uh, the requirement. If you want them to know, you can definitely go ahead and share this metrics with them. However, it is not required. This is completely internal to the business analyst. Unless your company or your team has agreed upon that you will be sharing this metrics to everyone, that's a separate part of the story. You will have to do this one. Otherwise, it is completely internal to you. That's one thing. Now, the second thing in the interviews, the interviewer may ask you, what is the life cycle of the traceability metrics? When does it officially end? Everything has one life cycle. You know, like we have a life cycle for the software development. We have project life cycle. We also have life cycle for trace metrics. So the moment your requirement documentation is signed off, officially baseline, you can call it off. And this is the life cycle of your traceability metrics. You start 
building the trust metrics when you have started capturing the requirement. And once the requirement document is signed off baseline, that is the end of the, uh, the trust metrics. However, you can always use these metrics anywhere during and after the project implementation. That is completely your, your like, you know, documentation for, for any uh, feature uses. But to answer in the interview, the trust metrics lifecycle ends when the project is officially signed off. Project documentation is officially signed off, actually. Cool. So any questions in this requirement management chapter here? Okay, cool. Um, so I see one question here in the chat. Um, do I have to upload this requirement document, uh, sorry, uh, the stress metrics to the functional requirement documentation? The answer is no. I already answered no, you don't need to. This is never part of the requirement documentation, either functional or non-functional, any of the requirements, you don't need to. This is internal to you and you can use it. However, as I said, you can share with your internal team members. Cool. So the next, wow. This is very interesting and very important. You have to be very, you know, look at this and you tell me the difference. What is happening here? This is one of the perfect examples you can find on internet where it tells how the poor requirement is being managed, the, the perfect example. You see the first image, first row, first image. This is how the customer explained the requirement to the business analyst. Second, this is what BA understood. Third, this is how the UI UX team or the designers have, uh, they have de designed uh, you know, this thing. Now the next thing tells, see how the developers have written the code, how everything is different than the actual requirement. Just look at this one. Now the next image tells how your business folks, your sales guys have explained what are they going to deliver to the business. They're giving really a great, great picture. You know, I will give you so far all those things and you will be enjoying having fun time. But actually that is not the case. That is their job to give, you know, explain these things this way and this is how they sell things. Now, if you go to the next row, first image, this is how the project was documented. What does it mean? There's nothing in the documentation. The project was not properly documented. In traditional waterfall, it is very important for the document. You have to document everything. Next image, this is how operational installation has happened. I mean, this is what we have actually installed. Now, the next is very interesting. This is how you have built the customers, you know, the billing invoices. Now, when it, when it, when it comes to the support, see what support you have provided to the business. Since there's nothing out there. Now, the last one is super interesting. This is actually the customer wanted. So now, what did you understand? Customer expectation was something else. However, customer explained it differently because at times, even customer doesn't know what they need. That's why it is very important for you to ask the probing questions. If you ask why you need this thing, probably they will answer the why and you will understand, okay, probably customer doesn't need this thing, customer needs something else. And based on the answer, based on the analysis, you can suggest customers what they actually want. So in this perfect example, when customer was explaining what they need, if BA would have asked the probing questions and asked why do they need, probably based on the answer, BA would have suggested them they don't want this thing. They actually want the last image of this, uh, this picture and then if that stage was correct remaining other stages will automatically be correct because if you understand correctly you will pass it to the next team very clearly and very efficiently and then next and then next and then next so the project will not fail so this was a perfect example hope you liked it tips you need to understand everything in detail. You don't need to memorize things, trust me, because you will memorize and you will forget tomorrow. So you, you have to understand the definitions, the key terms. Then only you will be able to score good points in the interviews. Before you try to answer the question in the interview, you should recognize the topic of the question, what actually the interviewer is asking. Don't yourself freak out in the wordy questions. You know, you have to be very careful. So don't be in a hurry. Be an active listener when your interviewer is asking, asking the questions, you have to be 
patient calm and understand clearly what they need and then accordingly form your answer. Interviewer way of listening answer is always 100% correct. Now, how would you know what way and what is the different way the interviewer wants to hear the answer? When you start communicating with them during the interviews, you will, you can sense things, you know, you will easily sense, okay, what is he asking or she's asking, what is he or she wants to hear from me? And then probably you can tweak your answer, you can give them the answer. The concept here is, if they want to hear something in a certain way, you should try to answer in that way so that you get a better chance of clearing those interviews. You know, there are different ways, hundreds of ways of doing the same thing. Probably you both are correct. The way you're answering is also correct, but you also have to make sure you are in the interviews and the interviewer wants to hear something indifferently. Do that differently and probably you will get your interviews cleared. Practice as many questions as you can. Yes, this is very important. You have to practice a lot. If you cannot practice, you will feel lost in the questions. So when I'm saying practice, what does it mean? If you get one question, and if you don't know the answer, go and find out the reason why you don't know the answers. Do you need to revisit the topics, the chapters? Go and read that out. Listen to the videos once again. Listen to the audios once again. Try to refresh your memories, idea. Talk to someone, your mentors, and get the right answer. So this is very important for you and you have to practice like as much questions as you can, you know, it's like just practicing five, six, seven direct questions will not help you in the interviews unless you really have a real time working experience in the projects. You know already a lot of things, but you're someone new, like you're a student, you, this might be your first job and uh, you just your mom, housewife, and you decided to, you know, start career in IT industry for you guys that you have never worked before. You need really good practice on all those situation-based questions, technical questions, and um, the direct question from uh, the chapters you are learning. So please be practicing. And always, as I say, the common terms that you will learn here in this course, you will always be using throughout your life, personally, professionally, with your peers, in your company, everywhere. So this is very important. Now the summary of this course, project requirement. A good requirement help a project team holding the project together and keep on track. This is very true. If you do not have the good requirements captured, how can you assume that people will be, you know, holding the project together? They will not because they will always feel lost because the requirement is not clear. They will always feeling like uh, confused, not clear, and they don't know what they are doing. So this will ultimately lead to project failure. So don't do this. You need to be making sure, just make certain you have good requirements captured and documented. A well-defined requirement ensures the project scope is well aligned. Obviously, a well-defined requirement, you have understood the requirement correctly, analyze that, define clearly. This will definitely should be aligned to the scope of the project. And then only you will be able to communicate and manage things well. Right, so this is very important. Scope change should always be handled through organizational change procedures that we just spoke. You should not be accepting or rejecting any of the change requests. Like on the fly, if someone is coming to you with a change request, take it as a change request, document it, review it, and follow your organizational procedures to take it forward. You should not be like rejecting or and accepting in the first go. No, don't do this thing. If you have a good project requirement, you know, the great project requirement, this will definitely help capture the full project scope, in a scope and out of a scope. So what does it mean? At certain times, you only focus on writing what is in a scope and what needs to be done. And at cert certain times, you forget to write what is not in a scope. The question is, should we really writing, which is what is not in a scope, are we really going to work on those things? The answer is the answer is yes and no, both. Yes, as in, yes, you don't need to write all those things which are not required, not out in a scope. But say an example, you were talking to a customer, capturing the requirement and customer gave you something that you on the fly analyzed and realized this cannot be completed. This cannot be done. It's not possible actually. Then you explained that thing to the, the person with the reason and the technical justification why this cannot be done. And you both agreed, okay, just let's just make it out of the scope. 
So you would purposefully would like to write down that in your documentation and write this is out of scope and this will not be done. Why? Probably in future during the testing phases, UAT phases, business may ask you the same thing once again. Business may not recall that discussion. What? How will you push it back? And how will you? How will you fight with that? How will you save your team? You need to have something written so you can go ahead and review the documentation. You can tell them. You can show them this was already mentioned that will not be done. That is out of the scope of this project, and we have agreed upon this thing. And you're safe. You're good. So this is sometimes it is important to write out of the scope document uh, requirements as well in in your documentation. A good project requirement document obviously it guides the team what to do the next. If I have the clear requirement documented, I know what I'm going to do next. This is very pretty clear. And if you have a good requirement document documented, this will help you to subcontract the work, share the ownership break down the larger chunk of the requirement into smaller manageable chunks that can be completed easily by the individual developers or the team by your team so you will not be able to do do these things correctly efficiently if you do not have the good requirement captured so this is very important for you of and the the for, for the risk identification of course if you do not know what needs to be done if you do not have exact actual well defined requirements you will not be able to catch all the risks you know, you will, you may not be able to identify the risks. So this is very important for you to have a good requirement documentation, good project requirement uh, captured, understood and managed. And then only you will be able to know what risks you are seeing and how do you manage those risks. You can, you know, plan the risk, risk management as well. Finally, a project manager should always be in control of the scope of the project, yes. However, this is collectively teamwork the ultimate responsibility lies to the project manager to manage the whole project along with the scope of the project. And as a BA, it is your ultimate accountability or responsibility to capture the good requirement so that the team can work on your requirement. All right, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, any questions for me for, for the last moment? All right. So I'm going to upload these videos to YouTube and uh, you can go ahead and watch it again and learn from these videos. If you have any questions, you can comment in the video or you can um, send me an email or probably we can discuss in the next meetings and I will try to answer all your questions. Thank you all for your time today in this meeting and I wish you all the best. Take care.